Sunday too, as I recall. Um, this was the first week that I actually had to uh, polish my shoes after I got home from church because of uh, the extra water that was on the ground last week. And I noticed in uh, Buffalo Creek that some of that water is still running off in Buffalo Creek too. Amen. Will you join me now as we prepare to worship God? Will you stand with me?
Christian people devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we affirm our faith together as we begin to worship today. I ask you, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And our opening hymn of praise this morning is number 482. Praise ye the Lord the Almighty. <clears throat> Church. I'm delighted that you have come to uh, share your fellowship with one another and your devotion to the Lord Jesus in this, this way today. So we have uh, quite a few announcements and um, inserts uh, in the bulletin. We had um, this big insert that comes with the preaching today, so we don't have to worry about that. And, and don't worry about the cost of these inserts, they're all free. <laughs> no. All right. So we'll get back, we'll get back to that one. Um, there is an insert, um, well it's not an insert, but on, printed on the back of your bulletin. Have you gotten to the back of your bulletin yet? There's a brief uh, history of Lent. And that's uh, particularly uh, on our calendar uh, today because uh, Lent begins uh, on Ash Wednesday, and Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday, February the 22nd. And we are going to have a special service here at Oxford Presbyterian at 6 o'clock in the evening. It's an evening service. And the, the season of Lent, as it explains, uh, as it explains there in your bulletin, uh, has a long history in the church. It doesn't have uh, quite as long a history, I would think, in the Presbyterian denomination of the Christian church. And there probably are uh, many of you who maybe are not familiar 
But when you've heard the term Lent, um, I've even made a few jokes about Lent from the pulpit uh, since I've been here. But it is a serious uh, time of the church year. It's a time when um, we particularly open ourselves up to recognizing uh, some of the wrongs that we have done um, and open ourselves up in a new and special way to receive God's grace. Um, traditionally, as it says in that uh, little uh, paragraph, traditionally it was when baptismal candidates took the training so that when they made a serious commitment to become a Christian on Easter day and were baptized, that they would be prepared for that experience. Now, that's not the way it's celebrated in most churches today, uh, but uh, we will have in the service on um, Wednesday, we'll have a time for reflection and recommitment uh, a time of confession and forgiveness and um, just just to give me an idea as I'm, I'm already planning the service of course but uh, how many of you have ever participated in an Ash Wednesday service okay so a few um, one of the things that sometimes happens, and this doesn't necessarily have to happen, but uh, one of the things that, that does uh, sometimes happen in Ash Wednesday services is that the people have the opportunity, if they desire to do so, is to have um, some form of the ashes, um, you know, not inscribed, that wouldn't be the right word, but some form of the ashes may be on the back of the hand uh, as a sign that uh, those are important uh, promises that are being made. We can do the service without that or with it. It means the same. Um, so um, I'm thinking that maybe since you all are just getting used to me and um, since all of us have not been involved in a Ash Wednesday service that this year um, will um, will not have the spreading of the ashes, um, but um, we'll have the service and the meaning will be the same, whether or not. Uh, and maybe at the service, I would uh, maybe make a few more uh, have, have a few more words say about how it could have been or would have been had we decided to use uh, real ashes. Actually, the ashes often come from uh, the burning of the um, palm leaves from the Easter before. Uh, it's where the ashes uh, ashes come from. So I think this year we'll, we'll try it without ashes since that would be more familiar then. And then I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not certain that I'll be around next year but <laughs> at this time, but uh, we'll see. Um, what other announcements need to be made? There are plenty of them in your bulletin, but uh, will anybody want to sponsor uh, an announcement while we have the opportunity here? Yes, Sarah? I'd just like to share with Jordan that I suspect we're all here this week to see the first daffodils come up. As early as it is, right? Wow. Amen. Yeah, that's always a joy. There's bright yellow daffodils. Um, someone else? Yeah, Linda. Oxford received a very nice note from Philip Clayton enclosed with the note. It was a very nice check. Um, I'll read the note from Philip. Dear Oxford Church Congregation, on behalf of the Clayton family, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, my wife Ava and I would like to thank you so very much for your generous donation. As a token of our gratitude, we would like you to please accept our donation to your church. Please use it as you see fit. We wish you all a wonderful 2023 and join you in prayer for peace in Ukraine. With the warmest wishes, Philip Clayton and Ava Tucker, happy Valentine's Day. We send our love to you all. Amen. Wow. 
<coughs> Any other uh, times of praise and thanksgiving this morning since we're on that on that vein? Yeah. Um, this morning, Bruce McDonald brought a picture uh, of, he did not take it, but uh, of Oxford Church in my back state in light of the Twilight Conference. So it's sitting out in the vestibule on the table. Oh, so take a look at that uh, when you leave this morning. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great, great evening. Wonderful evening. Someone else? Any concerns to share this morning while we're thinking about our prayers? If not, um, we're going to go on to a time of uh, prayer with the Lord, um, which is our privilege as Christian people. Uh, so will you join me now as we pray together? Lord Jesus, uh, we pray that as we've come together as your people today, that you would give us open ears to hear the message that you have for us here today. Lord, I know it's a personal one. And Lord, uh, open our hearts to receive that message. Lord, help us to uh, not be closed off or to be too overly cautious. But Lord, help us to, to soak in the message that you are giving us throughout our worship today, not just in the, in the sermon, but Lord, as you speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, let us be open uh, to that message, Lord. And Lord, uh, we ask that you would confirm that message upon our wills, so that when we need to change our lives to serve you better and conform uh, to your image, Lord, that we will, we will have the will to follow you in that way. Lord, we thank you for this approaching service on uh, Wednesday evening. We pray, Lord, that that would be a time when we could come very close to you own up to the mistakes that we have made and receive your forgiveness, <coughs> not just at that service, but uh, as we anticipate Easter and throughout the season of Lent, Lord, help us to receive that forgiveness that you so freely offer to us. Lord, uh, thank you for this congregation, Lord. I appreciate the ministry that you have given them in, in this place and how they reach out to the community in various ways. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to uh, encourage them in that ministry, encourage us as we try to go forth in that way together. Lord, thank you for this note that uh, we have received today uh, and things that have begun to encourage us. Lord, we pray that you would uh, bless the, uh, the transition, the pastoral transition that is, that is working its way through the, the kinds of processes that have to go, go on. And Lord, at each step of that process, uh, confirm the direction that uh, the church is taking. Lord, we thank you for uh, beautiful weather and a beautiful spot. Lord, we know that uh, the earth does need uh, rain and sun together. Um, last week we were a little overwhelmed with the rain and the uh, ice pellets, uh, but such a beautiful day you have given us uh, here today. We thank you for that, Lord. Now, Lord, uh, we know that your disciples asked you how they ought to pray, and you responded with a prayer that has become our Lord's prayer so bless us now as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Our, uh, our second hymn, and you can, you can remain seated, it's a wonderful um, hymn of God's care. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. It's number 387 in the blue hymn book. as it goes on from day to day. So we now have the opportunity to bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
in our ears and in our hearts. We present these offerings to you today. We pray that you would bless them and multiply them to do the work of your kingdom. We thank you for the privilege of bringing our offerings to you and the blessed feeling that we have in being able to help others. Lord, give us more and more opportunities according to your gracious will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The uh, scripture lesson uh, for today is from the Gospel of Luke. We're kind of following along in the Gospel of Luke. We're, we're leading up to um, what I and uh, other uh, folks who have studied the Gospel of Luke consider to be one of the most significant uh, verses in the Gospel of Luke, it's found at, um, at Luke 9, 51. We haven't got there yet, but trust me, we're, we're going that direction. Um, and it, it's a verse which says that in the midst of everything that was going on, Jesus steadfastly or resolutely set his face to go up to Jerusalem. He was on a journey. He was on a mission. And he would not be deterred from that mission. Um, and we're going to go on that journey uh, with him. So far, uh, we have just been in the preparation for the journey. But we're going to go on that, that journey with him up to Jerusalem on that mission. Now the two uh, handouts that have to do with the lesson today, the first is on the card, which is the, the scripture lesson for today. As you can see, um, we're only in chapter four, and we're not, you don't have to worry, we're not going to do every passage in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to skip ahead a little bit beginning in, uh, next Sunday. But this is in Luke uh, 4, 31 to 44. So I hope you will listen carefully to the word of God. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In a synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are! With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law mother was suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over, he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. 
At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now this, this other sheet that was in your insert today that has to do with the uh, concept of the Messiah, we're going to come to that a little later on. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Have you ever thought about the relationship between power and authority? We're going to be thinking about that today, so I just want to kind of raise it to the, the top level of your consciousness as we begin. But again, I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to that. There is a difference between power and authority. But the literary connection... The teacher in me always wants to review what we've already been over, preview, do the lesson, and then review. You've heard you teachers know this. So last week we were talking about Jesus at the synagogue in Nazareth, right? His hometown. We're talking about that last week, and we explored the idea of uh, how his friends had received him. Now we're at a different, we're at a different synagogue. The synagogue at Capernaum. You know, it's not that far from Nazareth to Capernaum, but that's what connects these passages together. Jesus was preaching in one synagogue one uh, Sabbath day. He's preaching in another synagogue another uh, Sabbath day. You know, what did the people want last week? The people at the synagogue in Nazareth. Well, we kind of boiled it down in the long run to they wanted uh, Jesus to put them on the map, to give them what they wanted, uh, to make them famous, to help them get ahead. In fact, when he read from the scroll of Isaiah, in Isaiah 40 and said today this prophetic word from Isaiah about the Messiah of God that prophetic word has been it's come true in your hearing I am the Messiah he said that was when people got not just a little upset, but a lot upset. And the passage turned on kind of the phrase, isn't this the carpenter's son, the son of Joseph? This is the guy we know. How can this guy be the Messiah? Now, we come forward to today's problem. <coughs> It's not really a problem anymore that he's the son of the carpenter. They don't know who he's the son of, I don't think. But there's another problem here that 
the demons are wreaking havoc with this guy and making a general disturbance in the Sabbath worship. Even the demons, though, even the demons know that Jesus has the power and authority to cast them out. And that's just what he does in this story. And in fact, since we went on from this story to another one, he does it twice. He does it several times as he's healing the general crowds. What, what, what's the difference between power and authority? Have you ever kind of thought through that? You know, power is the ability to do something, to enforce, some, enforce something. You know, my wife, um, my wife and I have been listening to uh, a book, and the the provenance of the book is um, at the time of the beginning of World War II, and the book is about a, a detective that's uh, uh, living in Britain. And you know she's involved in some of this stuff with the pre-war, the pre-war stuff. But that's kind of got us thinking about World War II. And you know, two of the first things that happened that kind of let people know that something bad was coming was when um, the Nazis in Germany took over Poland and took over Czechoslovakia two countries that were not part of Germany. Now, did, did Hitler have the power? Did the German army have the power to do that? They did. They just went ahead and moved in and said, here we are. This belongs to us. That's power. Did they have the authority to do that? Did they have... Did they have a paper that said, yeah, this is the right thing to do? Did they have a mission that this was the right thing to do? No, they didn't have any of it. They just did it because they had the power. But when Jesus is dealing with the demons, he has not only the power to drive the demons out, to get rid of the devil's handiwork, he has not only the power to do that, but he has the authority as the Messiah to do that. He was the creator of all that is. It says in the Gospel of John that by the word, the world was created and everything in it. That was Jesus' word. This was his mission. This was this was what he had come for. Now, let, let's take a look at let's take a look at this sheet because this will tell you. Because one of the things Jesus does in our scripture today is he shies away from letting the demons call him the Messiah. Why did he do that when it was true? In fact, we learned last week, he told that to the people in Nazareth, but he doesn't want the demons confusing the issue. And people were confused about the Messiah. Now this is just a, this is just a, a sheet that I prepared some years ago to help people understand why people were confused about Jesus. You know, you think, well, it, it should be perfectly clear, and it is perfectly clear to us, and we don't have any problem, I don't think, when we think about Jesus as the Messiah. But in Jesus' own time, people took that title Messiah in different ways. So I have listed on one side of this, uh, in one column, why he fit that title of the Messiah, and in the other column, why he did not fit that title of Messiah according to the conception 
that people had. And there were three conceptions. There's three parts to this. So first, first part is people wanted a political Messiah. And there are certain ways in which Jesus spoke and taught that he seemed to be a political Messiah. He talked about a kingdom, right? Well, a kingdom has a king. Well, Rome had a king. So maybe he's going to get rid of the Romans. All that's in that first, first comment. But then Jesus didn't use that title ordinarily in that sense. So people were confused. How about Jesus as a religious Messiah? <coughs> there was a fairly good-sized group of people residing in Israel that thought that the Messiah would come and that he would keep every aspect of the law of God that they knew about, that was written down in the Old Testament, that he would keep that, and if he could keep that for one day, then God's kingdom would come on earth. So they were, they were wanting a religious Messiah, a guy that who could really keep the law in the way we conceived of the law. He could really keep that law, and then everything would be all right for us, the religious Messiah. And it, again, Jesus fit the bill in some measure, but in some ways he did not. So in other words, the group who was political, they didn't get along with Jesus because he turned out not to be that kind of Messiah. The religious group, they got along with him sometimes, but not all the time because he didn't fit their expectations. And then finally on the back, this one's a little harder, he was the apocalyptic Messiah. Now apocalyptic is one of those big words that... Um, I was going to say you only hear it in church, but that might not quite be right. But mostly you only hear it in church, right? The apocalyptic, that just means that everything, everything was going to get better all at once and there was going to be a cataclysmic upheaval of society and the world and everything at one time and then the new order would come and everything would be better. The apocalyptic Messiah. And there were people who believed that. And in some ways, in some ways, Jesus talked that way. Although when Jesus talked about the apocalyptic Messiah, he mostly put that into the future. He told his disciples, when I come again, then everything is going to be changed. So that's that misunderstanding of the messiahship was why Jesus was very careful to tell the demons, cut that out. I, having demons talk about my messiahship is bound to mess people up. So Jesus had the authority and the power to do the mission that he was called to do. Now, after we get past the first healing of the, uh, of the stories that we've considered, the second healing is more normal, right? They go to the house of Simon Peter. Simon's mother-in-law has a fever. Interestingly enough, you some of you maybe, um, when, when I read, you might have, have noticed that it, uh, it says that she had a high fever. It's in verse 38 there. Um, who wrote the gospel of Luke? Luke, right? No problem there. But what we know about Luke is he probably uh, most likely was a doctor a physician, he uses a different word. He uses a different word for fever than the other Gospels. They, they just use the word for a regular fever. 
but we think because he was a physician, he used a more technical word which gets translated a high fever. You know, it's kind of the connection that we have with Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of the book of Acts. But the important thing in the second story about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, what happens once she gets healed? Uh, she gets up and she waits on the disciples. Now, um, maybe some of us have not had that pleasant of an experience waiting on people. But the word that's used there, the word, the Greek word that's used there, it's the same word that lies behind our word deacon. You have deacons in the church and those deacons are the people who are supposed to take care of the ordinary kinds of affairs of the church, the building, the property, you know, maybe some of the, the needy kinds of, of things, the distribution to the poor, uh, maybe the food program in the community, those sorts of things. Same word. Service in the kingdom. She got up, and because she was healed, she could serve in the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus doesn't perform miracles just to get attention. In fact, it's often quite true that he gets too much attention from the miracles that he performs. The reason he performs miracles is to redeem people for the kingdom of God, to make them servants of the king, to unleash within them the power to serve or the desire to serve. That's what happens here with Peter's mother-in-law. In the next story, then he goes back, he heals many, many people. And the demons are still coming out trying to proclaim him as Messiah. And he makes sure that they are quiet. You know, Jesus was not always what people wanted. But he was always what people needed. Notice at the end of the passage that we read how people try to hold on to Jesus. I, I mean, that's, that's easy to understand, right? I think it's easy to understand. So why is it Jesus says, I can't stay. I can't stay. I, I have to you can feel him, can you feel him edging away? I, I must move on. I can't, I can't stay here. Because his mission, his mission was larger than one person or one synagogue or one group of people. He had the power and authority to influence and to change the whole world and all of the people in that world. In fact, I think in a, in a very real kind of way, this passage about Jesus moving on is the same message that he gives to his disciples at the Last Supper when they are desperately trying to hold on to him. And they were fearful that he was going away. They were fearful that something bad was going to happen to him. And he says, no, th this is an incredible scripture. He says, no, it is better for you that I go. And you, you can hear the uproar of the disciples at the last supper. No, it's not. 
no, it's not, not, it's not better. But it was better. Because after preaching his message, he was going to send that same message in a form that everyone could receive it personally in the form of the Holy Spirit. It was better. Because when I was preaching, I could just be here and then there and then there and then there. But when I send the Holy Spirit, I can be everywhere with each of the believers. Jesus is with us individually and as a corporate body here this morning. He has that power and authority to enter into our lives in that way. We don't just have to get him to come and preach here. No, we have that Holy Spirit. You know, I'm participating in a, in a Bible study um, through Grace Presbyterian Church in, in town. And um, it meets on every other Wednesday night at the home of one of the families that participate and uh, last week we, we agreed uh, a couple weeks ago to study the book of Acts so this past Wednesday when we went to Bible study uh, another retired pastor um, in fact I think Ron Fritz has been out here to preach if I'm not mistaken right yeah, um, yeah Ron was leading the first chapter of Acts in the Bible study so then at the end, uh, a little bit unexpectedly, he said, uh, hey, Rob, why don't you take Acts 2? So in a week and a half from now, I'm supposed to teach Acts 2, but I love that passage. That's the passage where Jesus sends the Holy Spirit and the people in that congregation, which was a big one because it was the day of Pentecost throughout the uh, empire of Judaism. They come and they hear Peter's message and it says they were cut to the heart and said, what must we do? And of course, the answer to that is to receive the Holy Spirit and to follow the King, to follow the Messiah follow the one whom God has sent. Wow. You know, we're we're not always sure what God will do. But we were always, we are always certain that God will do what's best. It may not seem like it at the time, but that's the promise that we have in that Holy Spirit. So, just kind of summing up the three things to get from this, this passage. You know, I can't possibly know, even though we're a fairly small group, all the things that you all are going through right now. And you can't even know, I'm just one person, but you can't even know all the things that my wife and I are going through at the present time. But one thing that we can be certain of is that whatever we are going through as individuals or what you are going through as a church right now, being without a regular pastor, is that Jesus has the power and authority to govern your situation. You are not alone. If you have received, if you have received that Messiah Jesus into your life, into your heart, you are not alone. You are under God's power and authority. And he cares about you. He cares deeply about you. You know, even in cases of, of healing, you know, I was 
brought up a tried and true Presbyterian up in West Virginia. So, you know, I wouldn't say this was uh, official Presbyterian theology because it's not. But this is sort of um, this is sort of uh, um, Presbyterian theology, kind of on the the way it sometimes comes out, which is that well, you know, we Presbyterians, you know, we can handle most things, and then you know we'll let God take care of the rest. Um, so when when Sharon and I got married. Um, we came from a quite different tradition, which was, <clears throat> we're going to let God handle everything, the big or the small, whereas we Presbyterians so well, we can handle the little things. So not so long after um, we were married, we were vacationing, well, not vacationing, we were living in, in uh, the summer. We were living in Farmville, and we on one Saturday we took a trip up to Holiday Lake. So, lake in um, Central Virginia is a nice uh, kind of picnic spot, going swimming. So uh, we had a nice day there, and we had a out uh, taking a grill along. We had an outboard, and then it started to rain after we had that supper. So we ran quickly and got into the car, and. Um, so we got in the car, and all of a sudden, down underneath of the dash, it was drip, 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 drip. And I thought, we had just bought that car right before we got married. We only had it a couple, couple of months. It was a used car, but it was a wonderful car, and it proved to be a very wonderful car. But I was worried about the drip, drip, drip. And what does my wife say to me? Let's pray about it. <laughs> of course, I'm thinking, let's take it to a mechanic. <laughs> she prayed about the drip in that 69 Chevelle. It never leaked another drop the entire time. <laughs> Friends, I can't make that up. <laughs> that, that's the God's honest truth. And did I ever learn a lesson that day? On the other hand, as Presbyterians, we did pray for people who were in dire straits. We had a friend at church named uh, Anna Mary Henshaw, and my mother, who was a wonderful prayer and a good church folk. Um, she, she had been to visit Anna Mary. She was in intensive care. We would call it now, she was in hospice care. Mother came home and said, you know, I don't think she'll probably last more than two or three days. And, you know, then we'll have to have a funeral. But mother and others were still praying for her. And she recovered. She not only recovered enough but she recovered enough to go home and resume her normal life, and she lived three or four more years after she recovered. So I also learned a lesson from that. So it's the small things and the big things. God has the power and authority over all our lives. Now, remember what Jesus wants to redeem you for. He wants to redeem you for the kingdom of God and what you can contribute to the kingdom of God. He wants to give you what's useful for you to be productive in that kingdom. So if it's the healing of a high fever like Peter's mother-in-law, that's one thing. But whatever you need, to be productive in God's kingdom. He wants to give you that. He's calling you to that mission the same way Jesus was called to his mission.
and got all kinds of gifts to perform that mission. And remember, finally, remember, it's not just about you. It's not just about you as an individual. It's not just about Oxford Presbyterian Church. Jesus has many. God has many congregations, many people that he's looking out for, that he is calling into his kingdom. And we, we can't be the people who just want to hang on to Jesus so tightly that he can't fulfill that mission elsewhere. In fact, we may recognize that we are part of the mission of Jesus as he goes to preach in those other places or if he goes to minister in those other places, if he goes to pray for people in those other places, we have to recognize that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus in those places not just our own. This is the Jesus that we worship. This is the Jesus that we adore. This is the Jesus who set his face resolutely to go up to Jerusalem to finish that mission. Let us pray. Dear God, we are thankful that Jesus was not an exclusionary. We are thankful that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. We are thankful that Jesus has the power over demonic activity in our world and even in our lives, Lord. We are thankful that you have shown us the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, and we find our ministry, our ministry for you, we find in and through him and his power and authority. Lord, let us go forth as he went forth to be part and parcel of the kingdom of God. That's the Messiah that we want to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 260, a, a hymn written, by the way, by Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, number 260.
own people receive this charge, go forth and take the news of that king and his kingdom into the rest of your world. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.